Bum 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 literature gets a look. Let's talk about books. Hello and welcome back to Legs Talk About Books, the monthly literature podcast where, guess what? We talk about books. I'm your host, Hardleg Joe. Joining me, as per usual, we have CB Radio. Yes, I'm not going to try and roll my tongue for that. but oh, you it, can never get the tongue rolled out? Oh, I can get my tongue rolling rather well, but I'm oh, just okay. not going to do it. Yeah. Around here, that's kind of a rare thing. Like, when I was a kid, I could do that, and my parents were like, how are you doing that? Yeah, how, how, around the ragged rocks, the ragged rascal ran. Wow, very, yeah. very fancy. Yes. Yeah, man. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> Our intros are like, I always try to make them super serious and then they go off the rails like immediately. Oh, God. I, that's, I just love taking things off rails. It's, it's fine. Either way. My job um, as a conductor was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't see it, but I have face palming. I was trying to get us back on track and you, you literally derailed us with a derailing pun. <laughs> but yes. We're here today to talk about this month's book, which was Ring World by Larry Niven. A fascinating sci-fi from the 70s. A classic sci-fi. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I think from exactly 1970, if I, I'm not mistaken. But yeah, looking at the book, this was published in exactly 1970. So very, very early 70s, late 60s. And it kind of bridges the gap between... If you're looking earlier at stuff like The Martian Chronicle, John Carter of Mars, mm-hmm. these more pulpy science fiction stuff with daring spaceman going out and fighting aliens. I, that's a better way than I was going to say. I was going to say very loose science. Kinda. Yeah. You have that, and then as you get into the 80s, you have more like The Blade Runner going into like Star Trek The Next Generation, mm-hmm. where there's there's more of an emphasis on trying to make things kind of realistic and trying to actually think about how these cultures would form, how science and these futuristic things would affect people. If this happened, then and, what would happen? And Ringworld yeah. is like smack in the middle of that. But this is this is essentially a, a story of uh, a couple humans and a couple aliens in, what is this, like a thousand years in the future? Uh, yeah, I think they established it's it. It's very, very far in the future in a world mm. that is... Very dissimilar from ours in a lot of ways. This isn't the far future of 1997. This no, is... <laughs> this is. They immediately they immediately establish the fact that the main character is 200 years old. That we have the technology to, to live far longer. Mm-hmm. There are teleportation booths that connect every major city on Earth. There's uh, interstellar faster than light travel. Mm-hmm. There's like a galactic federation of planets and several different alien races that we've made contact with. Anti gravity, like all sorts of stuff. Stasis fields. Just uh, mention like uh, generators for food that just literally pump out a thing of food out of really nothing. Yeah. And it's the the thing that makes this kind of hard sci-fi is because it really does focus on that element of it. Like the first half of the story is almost exclusively exploring Earth and how it's different and meeting aliens and how what kind of technology and things make them different. And then they of course find the titular ring world, mm-hmm. which is basically if you if you've seen Halo, um, Halo kind of inspired by this, a big ring world. I would say uh, Halo is a small version of this. Yeah, that's the thing. Is the, the Halos are more like, they're like moon-sized or planet-sized, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like if you took a planet and then just like carved it so it was a ring. Mm-hmm. The ring world is more like a Dyson sphere. It's the size of like Earth's planetary orbit around the sun. It, it is, is ridiculous. Ridiculously massive. It's... Again, just like if you can imagine how far the Earth travels in a year around space, it's it's that long around, and then it's like ten times wider than Earth. I think they said. Yeah. It's... Where they're like, if you they're like, if you flattened out a map of the Earth and you put them like fifty across, that would be the width of the ring. It's it's one of those rare occasions in a book where uh, someone talks about like scale being very difficult to. Su- like, characters talk about not being able to picture the size of the ring world, and I'm right there with them. Yeah. I'm like... This is, he spends a lot of time trying to impress on you, like, just how unfathomably large and impossible it would be to create something like this. Mm-hmm. Which is why when they discover it, they, they have to explore it. Oh, they God. have to figure out 
who the hell made this thing, what happened to them, and more importantly, are they a threat? Because if they have that kind of technology, imagine what they could do in, like, a war or something like yeah. that. And I, I guess this that kind of be spoilers, but, like, at least in my instance, like, there's a picture of the ring world on the, the cover. Mm-hmm. Like, you literally know exactly what, what you're getting into. That's what the shadow squares look like? Yeah. I was thinking more bars, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I usually put up the uh, the cover on the screen, so if you're on YouTube watching this there should be a picture of the cover as always i'm audiobook he's physical book and it's a pretty short book it's a really short book and that that is a little bit to their detriment i'd say uh like it could stand to be it to have been longer it could have stand to be longer uh because uh just to jump in on one of my points on this they throw a lot at you and they just hope that you catch it yeah, I mean, I guess we, we should get into the review because we've been sort of talking about what this book is. Mm-hmm. And normally by now we've gotten into what did we actually think about this. And, you know, it's we've read a lot of books on this show where the plot and the characters don't really catch our attention. Mm-hmm. But the writing is really good and flowery. And we're like, oh, this, this prose is well written. It kept me invested. And this is the first time I think we've run into the exact opposite. Yes. The Ring World is not well written. No. It is difficult to follow at times. It is rambly at times. The plot basically exists just to explain sci-fi concepts. Mm -hmm. The concepts are neat. There's definitely a lot of stuff he throws at the wall, a lot of interesting ideas and images. But everything else around that is just there to serve that, that central thing. And I guess kind of the characters are kind of, they're fleshed out enough. Well, there's a reason why it's called Ring World and not like... The Adventures of Louis Wu. Yeah. (laughs) It's very much, you're in the midst of this and you're like, oh, I can picture some of this stuff. You should really like explain better on other stuff and they don't explain it well enough. Yeah. Like I said, he he spends the first half of this trying to get you an understanding of the the exact scale of the Ring World. Mm -hmm. And he, he does accomplish that by like chapter five. But then you're like 10 chapters in and he's trying to explain something that's just as massive and interesting and he can't devote that much time to it because they're on a journey, they're going through something and you're just kind of left like, wait, so it's it's what exactly? I th- uh, Okay, I think I get it. Mm-hmm. I think I, when, when you're trying to describe things that don't have any like earthly analog, it's kind of difficult. And then on the flip side of other things, like the character of Louis Wu, as if he's established, is 200 years old. The way he talks and thinks really does belie the idea of someone who's 200 years old and is a really interesting depth of that. The, the, the thing to me is he kind of goes back and forth. There are times when they clearly thought about what it would be like to be 200 years old, how much knowledge and experience and how that would craft you. And there are other times when he just acts like a 30-year-old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, or like a 25-year-old or something like that. This or book is really horny. However old Larry Niven was. I wouldn't say it's really horny because it doesn't get into like a lot of details. It does a lot of fade to black or innuendo about stuff. No. But there it, is a lot it, of sex. Yes. I was going to say like in a book that's this short, there's at least five sex scenes. Yeah, but a lot of them are just like we went to bed and then later we woke up naked. There are some of them that get real graphic. Uh, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't see the word penis or hardness at all. No, but when they talk about being impaled. Yeah, but that's still kind of like innuendo-y or whatever. You could read this in high school, and I don't think they would really give that much that that much of a hoot. <sighs> Although I don't know why you would read this in high school, because again, it's. I, I don't know. Usually when I when I review stuff like this, I try to say, like, who I would recommend it to. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the first books that I'm like, I'm not sure I can really recommend it. Because the only thing it does really well is Conf- throw out a whole bunch of cool sci-fi concepts. And the thing is, if you want to know about the concepts in this book, you could, like, read a wiki. And yep. you would get the same information in half the time. Or you could listen to us talk about them. Like, I don't think there's anything that you need to experience the journey with. Because at the end of the day, mostly what you're getting is cool descriptions of the ring world and aliens and concepts and stuff. I would say one part of the book is worth the experience. But that would be getting into spoilers right now. And we're going to start just talking about that later. And yeah, like I said, I can't really recommend this to anyone unless... 
This does take place in the the uh, a shared universe called Known Space, mm-hmm. where this guy has not only written a whole bunch of books in that universe, he's also uh, licensed it out to other people. So this is one of the first examples, one of the earliest examples of like a big, huge shared universe where like they mention in this something called the Man Kazin Wars. Mm-hmm. There is a series of fifteen books documenting the Man Kazin Wars written by other author the covers are wild too joe if you can get a couple of covers of that and show them up here you yeah let me let me show yeah, brandon was, real quick you would better show me one of these <laughs> <laughs> a weary tiger king sits upon his throne <laughs> just like giant tiger man holding laser gun but yeah either way there, there's a huge expanded universe a lot of people really like the kazin because they're they're kind of like furry cat aliens or whatever and people if you make a furry it, it's kind of like the the field of dreams if you furry they will come yeah. wrong word if you <laughs> if you furry they will approach what is the world coming to porn mostly <laughs> <laughs> fuck but yeah my point is if you want to get involved in this sci-fi universe, if you want to see sort of like the forerunner for what would become like the Star Wars expanded universe, the mm-hmm. Star Trek expanded universe that existed pretty much only exclusively in books, um, this is a good place to start. And actually, I remember I was looking up reviews of this after I finished reading it, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of the reviews said the same thing that we did, that it was like, high on concept, low on plot. Yeah. And I remember reading a comment from someone, like, arguing against that, being like, just reading Ringworld is like just reading The Two Towers. You're starting in the middle of a story. There's stuff that happens before, there's stuff that comes after, and you're only getting a little bit. You have to read a lot more of known space before you really appreciate what this is. But that's completely bass backwards in the sense that this is the first book that Larry Niven wrote. I don't think it is, actually. Is it? Yeah, this is the first in the Ring World set, but it's not his first one set in known space. Ah, okay. That, so he, he does that have does other ones the... that, that take place in the same shared universe. Mm-hmm. That's why he didn't explain some stuff about, like, what the slaver weapons were, or, like... What the hell a slaver was. Yeah, <laughs> I had to look that up my own. That, this does bring up a lot of, like, stuff where you, you assume... Because of how he mentions it, that it'll get brought up later, and no, it's just there to sort of lead you into the expanded universe. It's just like, he's just tossing these things at the wall, and I'm just like, I don't know what, uh, can you slow down? I'd like to at least have yeah. a so, little bit of that. If you're interested in trying to get into a whole expanded universe, that might be fun, because again, as you're reading more of this stuff, you get hints of other books and other things. I do have a kind of person that... Uh, you could recommend this to someone who's already got a plot and a story, but they don't have a lot of really interesting concepts. <laughs> no, I mean, like this thing has so many, it has so many concepts so, to spare. It feels like you could probably just, you could build off of that. Funny story about this. So our, our mutual friend that uh, you all listening might know is bootleg drew. Mm-hmm. He was trying to come up with a D and D campaign. And he was like, Joe, do you have any ideas for that? Yep, there and we I go. And I was like, a bunch of wizards are unearthing some ancient ruins, and they find a doorway. And they open that doorway, and instead of going to the other side of the room, it goes to some world, and it has a giant arch over it. And they uh... have no idea what it's like. It's like a completely different reality. And so the king sends you and your team to go explore it. And I basically just started throwing out ideas without telling him they were, like, sci-fi things. Just explaining it, like... Because that's one of the cool things. They talk about what it's like to stand on the ring world. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The the religions that base off it, where it's like, the arch, it shall be... The the sun hangs from the arch. It's like, no, your world's just that fucking big. Because that's the thing, is, like, it is round, but it's so big that standing on it seems flat. Mm -hmm. And then just way off in the distance, you can basically see this, like, very thin column that arches over the sky and goes behind the sun. Uh, I don't even... Okay, um, this is something I never wrote to you about, but no book, and I hope none ever will, has ever given me vertigo just by fucking listening to it. I have, like, I, I walk around a lot when I listen to these books, and I had to, at several point in time, just be like, I am stable on the ground. I am fine. There was so many times they're talking about, like, the concept of looking into space and seeing, like, 
That or the shifting gravity and stuff on the spaceship. Or... Oddly enough, the shifting gravity is not as much of an issue for me. It's those like whenever you see a, a shot from space and you see the curvature of the Earth. Yeah, mm. where it's just like you're floating and you're that high up. Yeah, my brain doesn't can't register that well. <laughs> this book gave me that. This book was just like that. Sh- that shot personified in a in verbal form, and I just hate it. I hate it, and I. I love it and I hate it at the same yeah. time. But yeah, I think in, in summary, this is a weird case where both of us, we're not upset that we read this book. Not right? at like, all. This was not a waste of time. This was not a bad book, but it's hard to recommend because mm-hmm. what it offers is something you can get just by reading a synopsis, essentially. Yeah. Just by talking to someone who's read it. It reminds me in a way kind of of a pathologic where it's like, oh no, don't play this. But listen to me talk about it for a little bit, because there's some neat stuff here. Yeah. But yeah, regardless, I say that a lot. That's like my big transition statement. It's like, but yeah, I need to think of new transitions. If you have any ideas, leave them down in the comments. Here's one. Here's one. But Uh, yeah, we're... uh, (laughs) Now I'm never going to be able to say it and not think about it. No, you you just like, I was going to give you a transition, but now... Here's one is not a transition. That wasn't going to be, I was going to say, here's a transition. Okay, well, what is your transition? In summary, we're moving on to the next part. There's not, we're not summarizing anything. I didn't have one. I didn't have one. <laughs> Flowery words. Okay. But mm. yeah. Moving we're on. We're moving on. We, we rambled enough about what we thought about this book. If, if, if you are interested, if you're like, I don't care what you're going to say, reverse psychology, I'm going to go read this just to spite you. Go do that now, because Mm -hmm. from here on in, we're just going to be talking about those interesting concepts, the interesting ideals that we like from this. And we're going to assume either that you've already read or that you haven't read. We don't do synopses here. Go to Wikipedia for that. But anyway, (laughs) I I found a new one. Who needs yeah when you have anyway? It's longer and it still has the letter Y in it, (laughs) which is one of my favorite letters. Why? Exactly. (laughs) Anyway, we've got some discussion points here, and I think nothing looms over this book more than the concept of genetic luck. Holy crap. Is that... This is what I was talking about before when I said it would be spoilers to talk about it, but I love the way that this book does it. I like how they take the idea of someone being lucky as opposed to trying to figure out the narrative loopholes and like jumps you'd have to do to be like oh this person expects these things to happen take it from the outside perspective and just have this character who's incredibly lucky and is seen to not understand things as much oh uh, maybe maybe it's because uh i've read dune already and dune kind of the the main character of dune was basically bred after generations of generations to be like a main character mm-hmm. <laughs> And he has sort of this existential crisis of realizing that, like, he doesn't have control over his destiny. That what he's, what he is, is the culmination of millions of years of people striving towards something. And he can do nothing but ride along with it and hope to not die. Yeah, I mean, that is similar, but this one is just, like, very... I love the the, uh, the, the analysis that uh, Louis gives at the end of the book of her, is that she was this shell of a girl. That had never had any kind of problems in her life. And yet she... Because she was so lucky. Because she was so lucky, she never had any of those other parts of a person that fill in and make you kind of a 3D person. She was just flat. Uh, Even though she was a very fun person to be around and she was also, uh, like, enjoyable, she would never be able to sympathize. And I like that. I like that in a way. It, It bothers me. Because it kind of assumes that luck is personified. Mm -hmm. That luck wants you to be a 3D fulfilled person. When if if you were looking at this as like an evolutionary thing where luck just wanted to protect you, to make good fortunate things happen to you, Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any need for you to become a 3D fulfilled person who understands the world. Fair point. I think if the concept they explained worked as they explained it, um, Tila never would have gone to the ring world. She would have been able to have her development on Earth where it was much safer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was expecting... I was kind of let down because I was expecting 
they would find something on the ring world that would save all of humanity to the point that like Tila had to be here not just for her own luck but for the luck of like 10 or whatever generations down the line where it's you know, a, a big part of this is the galactic core is exploding in 10,000 years. Yeah. And they're like, the Ringworlders might have the technology to uh, escape from that, or at least to to withstand it a lot better. And technically they do. Yeah. And so the idea that Tila, by going there, would have some sort of thing that would help her and her descendants survive would make a lot more sense evolutionarily then she needed to go there to fall in love because love needed her because luck needed her to have like a well-rounded personality. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I, it it felt fun for the ride. That's it all. was fun for the ride, but I I distinctly remember um, going on Twitter when I was like one chapter in, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, this is very interesting. Lots of sci-fi stuff being thrown at to you. It's really nice and refreshing to read some hard science fiction, and then I got to chapter three about Tila Brown and I was like oh things just took a sudden turn into Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy really Territory yeah. we're like this is no longer high sci-fi this is now taking like a pop sci-fi like here's a wicked idea man like whoa like what if luck was genetic <laughs> yeah the the idea of it kind of math wise kind of broke down well but like other than that, it was really dumb. There, there, there is, again, there's a core concept that's really interesting there. One thing that's always interested me, I think his name was Jon Snow, not from... Game of Thrones. Not from Game of Thrones, <laughs> but there's a real scientist named Jon Snow. Does who, he know nothing? Yes, yeah, people thought he did. <laughs> so the, the big thing was he was one of the first people who figured out how uh, dysentery spreads mm. back in a time when people thought like you got sick because of miasmas in the air yeah. or because of like humors in your body being out of whack. Now we know it's gremlins in your stomach. <laughs> but he, he figured out that like, you know, the sick people were letting out something that was getting into the water and making other people sick. Like, he mapped it out how it spread. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have an idea of what that could be. He had no concept of germs or microbiology. And he was trying to explain it to other people. And he's like, I don't know why it does this, but I've noticed this pattern. Yeah. And I really like that idea of, like, he discovered germs, he just didn't know germs existed back then. So there, there's this idea of, like, what if what we consider luck, what if something about our probability can be determined by something around us, there is some sort of force we don't understand that mm -hmm. we can manipulate, and uh, that there is a genetic link to it. Like, that idea could possibly make sense, but you'd have to do it, like, consistently, and you'd have to do it mm -hmm. much more seriously than this did it. Yeah. Though I will say, um, the the best way I've heard it described was when I I haven't really been doing a lot of research into it, but I like your description of it in the sense that this is a great way to put a sci-fi spin on the hero of destiny, yeah. and fate. It is it's really interesting way to put it that way because basically Tila Brown finds the hero of destiny and <laughs> literally is like, you think you got a destiny? I'm lucky as hell. Um, yeah, I, I guess that that was kind of what bothered me, was just that they kept calling it luck, when it's clearly like, we're calling it luck because we don't know what it actually is. Mm -hmm. It's just the closest thing we can think is luck. Yeah. But that was, I guess that was why it seemed cartoony to me, because in the end it followed, like, whatever Louis Wu thought would be lucky for her, mm -hmm. and not, like, whatever this inherent thing that has caused her to, to survive. Because mm -hmm. I guess we should explain for the people who didn't listen. The reason why she's so lucky is because America, uh, not America, the world had a yep. popu an overpopulation problem. And to solve that, um, I think they said originally they were doing like eugenics where like people with certain IQs were allowed to breed, which is very dumb, by the way. Yeah. Um, for reasons I can't go into. But apparently it, it was corrupted. Um, they found out that certain people were cheating, it wasn't being done right. Yeah. So, they're like, the only fair way to do this is with a lottery. So, for however many years, it was randomly selected who would be able to have children. 
Mm -hmm. And T. LeBron's parents were both randomly selected. Their grandparents were randomly selected. They made a point of like, you know, if, if you get randomly selected, your wife... You know, she can have kids. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to find someone else who's randomly selected. But if two people happen to get randomly selected, well, hey, isn't that lucky? Yeah. And, and then, so it's the only reason she exists is because ten generations of people got extremely lucky. Yeah. And they're like, clearly humans have been breeding for luck. <laughs> we have we have used eugenics to make lucky people. I'm like, I don't think it works that way. <laughs> It doesn't work that way, but it does kind of in a in a way it makes sense. It makes it makes uh, some sense. It makes semblance of sense. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes sense if you don't like analyze it too much. If you assume that luck is some sort of natural feature. If we're not going into like a beautiful mind probability crap here, we would be like, <laughs> it would make sense. But if you want to pull back the gray curtain of that and be like, here's all of the math and how stupid that is. <laughs> Then yeah. Look at this. It's not even math. It's just th this idea that like, again, it's it's not luck they were actually breeding for. It was your ability to survive and reproduce randomly. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I don't like that. That um, at the end it turns out that like, oh, she's she she's learning to love and have a fulfilling life. I'm like, that doesn't help you survive and reproduce. Mm -hmm. That is not what we have been uh, breeding people for. Actually, no, the the, the roundabout way is that uh, she learned that by happenstance. That wasn't actually uh, caused by the luck. That was a secondary thing. The terrifying things that happened to her weren't things that caused her to feel fear and to know fear. They were there to put her in the exact position that she was going to be at to meet the person that would keep her safe for the rest of her, what seemed to be going to be in an eternal life. Yeah, because everyone gets to live forever pretty much in this, unless they get killed. And with Tila Brown, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Long may she, she reign. Yeah, I'm curious to see there are direct sequels to this. When I heard there were sequels to Ringworld, I assumed it would be like other tales from Ringworld. Mm -hmm. But I looked into it and apparently, no, the Ringworld engineers specifically deals with, they they come back and get Louis Wu and uh, the Kazin, formerly known as Speaker to Animals. Oh yeah, because he who, got a name. He, he got his definitely name. got a fucking name after what he did. Can we talk about briefly, Speaker to Animals is the best character in this book. I'm actually going to have to go with Nessus. I, okay, Speaker to Animals the best character. Uh, the best alien design, I would have to go, like... The puppeteers have the best. Nessus himself is morally, he's a chore. morally kind of bad. He's a chore. He's a chore. He's yeah. he's difficult to deal with and stuff. Mm -hmm. Although, I'm not sure if they tried to portray this or if it just kind of happened, but I think he has, like, alien bipolar. Yeah. Because he seems to go through, like, manic episodes and depressive episodes. Yep. Which is really kind of, um... Which makes sense, because he's got two literal heads. Yeah, but his brains aren't in his heads. His brain's in his ass, like everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> uh. I do like... It's one of those things, like, you think... When he gets one of his heads cut off for at the at the end... Spoiler. A, yeah. We're already in the spoilers. Yeah, I know. For, for a brief moment, I was like, oh, oh no, no, how is he going to think? And then I was like, oh, wait, no, his, his brain's, brain's not in, in the head. Brain's in his ass. His head has one of his eyes and his mouth, and his mouth is also his hands. It's a weird design. And he's a tripod? Yeah. Which, uh, I, I, but, like, the he's got hooves. It's, it's He's got a very interesting design, and I love how, story-wise, how the, he was able to make him his emotions come through in, like, physical form rather well. Yeah, like uh, it was weird with the uh, with speaker to animal. I didn't get always get everything he was doing, but with uh, Nessus, I was definitely there. Like he's called up, he's curled up in a ball. His heads do stuff that show like kind of they convey his emotions in a way that's not human, but that's understandable. Yeah, he's very very good with that. Yeah, one. the aliens are handled really really well here. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that you get an, an alien that's as biologically different from humans as Nessus is, mm -hmm. who still manages to be, like, a cool companion that you empathize with and understand. But also, at the same time, like, you know, Speaker is much more human-looking. He's basically a big cat boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> call, he's more of, like, a tiger man. But if you furry, they will, they will come. <laughs> God, Gross. I hate that I said that. You're welcome. But um, he, he's much more human in appearance, but I still like that there were moments where he would do something. He'd have some, like, physical tick 
or he, he would speak in a certain way, and Louis would be like, this means something in their culture, and I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> this is some alien emotion, and I'm not getting the signal. And then there's not the unspoken ones, but the outsiders, which oh, are yeah. basically just a gas, a, a sentient gas, which is really a strange concept. And I don't know. Well, they're how not. You... They're not a gas. They're they're they have like gas filled system. Like they they have a physical body. Oh, they're just filled with gas. They're very, very fragile. I always thought that they were just like, maybe not a gas, but they were like very in-between kind of matter type thing. They, they don't explain them very well, but from what I understand, they're, they're basically, they were on a planet, they come from a planet that's very, very low gravity. Mm-hmm. And um, it's also, I think they're, they say they're helium or nitrogen based or whatever, so that might their bodies why. are kind of light. And so they're like they're kind of like balloons, mm-hmm. um, with arms and legs and stuff. And they can't land on planets. And they're also cold blooded, so they have to like stay in the heat. But mm-hmm. I think they said to like regulate their body temperature. Half of them has to be hot, and half has to be cold. Which is really weird. But... They're they're really the, the outsiders are weird in that they have more technology than anyone else. But puppeteers are like, yeah, we don't worry about them because they're so fragile. They never get into a war because mm-hmm. they know they cannot win a fight. Yeah. They are they are the most fragile alien species and they can't land on most planets. They mostly hang out in space in their their giant um space stations. There's never going to be an outsiders bar brawl. Yeah. Um but the the one that I would say that they dropped the ball on the most though was uh the Ringworld people. Yeah, which are just humans. They're just humans. Yeah, for some reason the 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 people on Ringworld are just humans. Mhm. And they try to do something where they're like cuz what was it? The interesting thing about the Ring Worlders is that they built the Ring World, but apparently they don't have faster than light travel. Yep. They have they have near light speed travel, but they could never figure out the physics to go faster. I forget exactly how they explained it. Some some wishy washy techno babble thing. Yeah. It was it was never all that specific, but they're like, oh yeah, humans used to think it was impossible to go faster than the speed of light, and then we figured out these like nodes in space that allow you to travel faster. And, some, and and they, they eventually meet a ring world engineer and she's like, you can't go faster than light. That's not possible. And, yeah. and he's like, I, I got a thing or two to teach you. Even the ring world is, uh, engineers, uh, their design's a little bit lackluster too. Yeah, just bald humans. No, nah, no, they're, they're basically just like, they have bald tops uh, and uh, long hair. They, they have a part business in the front, party in the back. <laughs> Uh, very like they, no, it's more like Tibetan monk in the front and uh, party on the the sides. Yeah. And then they got a monkey face, an actual legit like flat. I've looked up pictures too. Oh, okay. Like maybe, unrepresented. Maybe the actual engineers, the ones we met, were always sort of like half breeds or descendants or something like that. Oh, okay, fair point, fair point. But yeah, no, like for. From... But yeah, it's it's just one of those things where. You know, you get to the ring world and then they find out it's like, it's humans or offshoots of humans. I think they mentioned the ones living on the ground have, like, hair on their faces. Mm. Like, not just beards, but, like, they cover their foreheads and their cheeks and stuff where only their eyes are visible. Oh, makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so they're, like, they're they're humans, they just evolved more fur, Yeah, they were, per- from, what I, from what it looked like, they were just, like, yes, they were primates, and all people will evolve the same way that way. Like, no, that's... No, they all went different, but they... They talked about how, like, oh, they must have somehow seeded Earth and then got millions and millions of light years away and then built the ring world all without ever developing faster than light. Faster than light. And in the end, it just sort of feels uh, cheap because, like, you could have just made an alien thing. Mm-hmm. I don't, yeah. I don't know why they didn't just make an alien ring world race. You could have just said that they're all purple and then they have four eyes and then there you go. Could have a, or you could just, you know, it almost would have been more satisfying to just never find anyone mm-hmm. and just have it be like a mystery. And then there's the sunflowers, which makes no fucking sense. I don't know what they are. The sunflowers? And I... they have reflective things and they can like get the sunlight and focus it to a point like a magnifying glass and like burn shit. Basically, it's just a row of source. <laughs> I don't freaking get them. <clears throat> All right, but uh, moving on from aliens, uh, <laughs> I'm just a real sore subject. I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where it's like you know, we're you you complain, I complain a little bit, but again, we can't stress. We we always got to stress this, especially after the Way of Kings episode, where people are like, "Oh, you did it was bitch." Yeah, it's no. like no, we 
the, the way I see it, there's more lessons you can learn in failure than you can learn from success. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, the alien species were done really, really oh, well. Oh, God, yes. But other than saying, like, it was neat how different from they were from humans, it was neat how they had non-human expressions and stuff, and they thought of how their cultures would be. Um, there's more to talk about with what they did wrong than what they did right. Yeah, and and just because it's uh, a lot of the stuff that they threw at you was very hard to digest in certain areas and very hard to get through doesn't mean that those ideas weren't worth things and they weren't actually yeah. of use. They are very good ideas. You know, if, if there's something that gets people involved in the known universe, universe, known, it's known space, known space universe. Sorry. It's the idea that like you would get a chance to learn more about the puppeteers. I, actually, I would say they, the thing that gets people into the known, uh, known space universe is the ideas. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, just... there are the ideas, but like, personally, they, they, they've raised a whole bunch of questions mm-hmm. about the puppeteer universe and how they evolved and what their society was like, mm-hmm. and then never mm-hmm. brought them up again. And in fact, I was really like, you know, Nessus gets his head cut off, one of his heads cut off, and they basically put him in like cryogenic suspension, and then he just never wakes up by the end of the book. And it's like, what did, did he serve? I, no, I no, they, they get on the ship and they wally him up. They, they have extra parts for him. Yeah. I mean, they mentioned that he survives or whatever, but it's like, there's we never learn what happened. Did he succeed? That, Does he get to mate? That would be one uh, legitimately like major critique, is that the ending is very... It's super abrupt. Very It, it feels like he's just like, you know, they, they get off the ring world, and then he's like, I have no more concepts to explore. We're done. <laughs> now, I like the idea that the book is actually about Tila Brown, and as soon as she's out of the picture, the book just like, um, uh, yeah, uh, Louie got off the planet with all his friends. There you In go. The end. I went through a volcano. Yay. Mm-hmm. It all worked out. Which was, I'm going to be honest, it, that one didn't, I, that one was hard for me to understand. That was, but. It was weird. It, it felt rushed at the end. Mm-hmm. But. On from concepts like that to characters. Like, yes. the main boy, Louis Wu, is genuinely fascinating. Like, he's he's this uh, very... He's this mix between this very, like, uh, your, your golden age sci-fi of, like, I am an adventurer to yeah. see the world. The guy I've written down is, like, he's a mix between pulp sci-fi adventurers like John Carter and Adam Strange. These, like... Man goes out to explore the wild blue yonder. Sleeps with strange and exotic women. Except he's like a 200-year-old man with little athletic ability who relies on his, his age, intelligence, and wisdom. So in that way, he's more like the la- he's more like Picard. Mm-hmm. He's like this weird mix between Picard and John Carter. Where it's like, old man goes out and explores strange new worlds. And, and, and maybe punches something. And on top of that, his narrative is his narration is very, very reminiscent of noir for me. He's very just like, I want to see adventure because I'm just done with all of this shit. I've been around for 200 years. I've seen everything there is to see. Give me something alien. Give Give me me something something new. new. Yeah, like he's very that that is a really interesting character to me. To yeah, yeah, it's one of those things where you know, if you, again, if you're looking at sci-fi as these two different eras, the old pulpy era and the new more analytical era, he is interesting because he's halfway in between, and because of that, there's not really anything else like him, right? Because mm-hmm. like he, characters like him only existed in like one or two books before they evolved into Picard's. Yeah. Into the, until you got the, the scientist heroes. Yeah, yeah. The ones who are going out and studying things and being like, well, is it morally right to assume that they have the same axioms that we do? We and can't be ones to assume. Louis Wu didn't give two shits about that type. Like, the, the prime directive was not in his book. I mean, like, he thinks about it for a second, but then he takes out his flashlight laser and is like, well, I'm gonna survive. <laughs> it's all about me, baby. <laughs> Yeah. I'm getting off this rock. This is also the character that's just like, you know what? Sleeping with one of these would be morally... Nope, we're doing this. Yeah. I mean, that that is one thing that I wanted to say about him. It's sort of an element of his character, but it also kind of reflects another point about this book that's really interesting. Really interesting about sci-fi in general is that by looking at what people of the time thought mm-hmm. about the future, it kind of reflects what the people of the time were like. 
you know, Louis Wu feels very 70s. <laughs> I love the fact that, yeah, speaking of, like, from a setting point, they're like, teleportation discs, faster than light travel. How are we listening to music? Still on cassettes. Still on cassettes. Still magnetic tape, baby. Yeah, like, uh... Mm. We have to communicate long distances. Better break out the walkie-talkies. Uh, because cell phones and communicators are too advanced for us. But then they also have a thing that's connected to an AI that translates for them. And I'm like... I, li- I like that they're... Co- at least the translator, like, it has to listen a little bit to what people say yeah, beforehand. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's not like... Instantaneous. Wishy- yeah, it's not instantly just picks up a new language and figures it out yeah the very much a book of the 70s very much a character of the 70s Mm -hmm. and stuff and i I think one of the biggest things that annoyed me about him and again it's i hesitate to say i was offended because offended you kind of think of people like aghast or whatever but Uh i was just like well that's just dumb was um just kind of like their stance on women in general Mm -hmm. like you said there's there's two female characters in this and they both sleep with louis Wu. wouldn't you (laughs) wouldn't look at that character wouldn't you no it's Uh, just this very free love 60s 70s we're like well i'm a handsome you're a woman and i'm a man what's not to do and they make this big deal about louis Wu. yeah (laughs) well he's like sleeping and like the alien uh ring world engineer descendant just comes in and like hops on top of him and he's like well i'm a guy there's nothing i can do and i'm like we're not all meatheads come on buddy that's just as insulting to us as it is to them yeah i mean like it's (sighs) it's like he's 200 years old he must have slept with who knows how many people it's like if anything i'd imagine he'd be like well you think you could tempt me with that i'd I stopped caring about my dick a hundred years ago, honey. Libido dropped, like, after my 30s. It's actually a thing. Yeah, that's why I said, like, sometimes Louis Wu acts like a 200-year-old, and sometimes he acts like a 20-year-old. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, eh, I mean, she may be bald and half alien and on a foreign planet, and who knows what kind of STDs they have on the ring world. I mean, their whole society did collapse, but... You know, eh. as a as a, like... A little funny thing I'm picturing in my head is that it's Louis Wu there, and he's got, instead of an angel and a devil, he's got a Kirk and a Picard on his shoulder. <laughs> and Kirk's just like, sleep with her. You know, she's hot. Come on. Exotic alien women? You know what to do, sir. Mm. Picard's like, surely there are more logical ways that we could have this interaction. And then you get Kirk, is just like, but look what I can do. And it's like, he's got a point. Yeah. But no, they, they, especially, what was it? There's the one line, because uh, Nessus has the TASP, which is a device that, that induces the pleasure center in your brain, which is, um, I guess, tiny spoilers for the next book, because he uses he only uses it on Louis once, because mm-hmm. um, he thinks Louis is about to attack him. And they mention where they're like, this is almost addictive, because it literally just, like, endorphins straight oh, to your God, brain. Yes. And afterwards, he's like, I feel this intense sadness of loss because I know I'll never feel anything as good as that again. <laughs> He's like, is it even worth going on? He has to like make sure he stays away from ledges for a little bit. Um, in book two, it starts, apparently he's become a uh, wire head, which is a kind of drug addict where you put a wire into your brain that stimulates the, uh, the pleasure center of it. Uh, yeah. He's like, yep, he never quite recovered from the task. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, I'm I'm kind of tired of these books that we're reading having like immediate pleasure center stimulating thing. <laughs> I'm tired of this shit. It's, it's really get, weird. It's really getting it's it's a it's a thing. I'm that's a me thing. And also, it doesn't make sense that you could do it wirelessly. Like, how are you changing someone's brain chemistry with white? What? Why? You got five G in there? What's going on? Electromagnetic waves dealing with the synapses in the brain most likely misfiring. Possibly, but I mean, you have to make the chemicals and everything go. This is also a place where they just have a root that gives you extended life and they never explain it, so you're getting... Booster Spice? Booster Spice doesn't tell you shit. (laughs) Booster Spice sounds like it's a fucking Red Bull came out with it one day and was just like, we got stuff that'll make you grow older and not die. (laughs) Well, it won't make you grow older. Yeah. Because Louis has the body of like a 30-year-old or whatever. Booster Spice just sounds like... I I think they talk about it uh coming from like sea life which actually makes sense i'm not okay. sure if you're familiar with the uh sea slug that can live forever because it doesn't die or starfish that can be severed and make another body there's a there's a whole bunch of sea animals where like 
aging is not necessarily a natural process. Like our cells should be able to replicate perfectly and just continue to create a new body for us. Mm -hmm. It's just over time as they replicate, like one in a million cells is mutated. And then those mutated ones spread and have, have, uh, make more cells. Mm -hmm. And over time you just have more mutated cells than healthy cells. Anything that comes from the bottom of the sea makes me immediately say the words Bioshock <laughs> and say, this is a bad idea. Well, what was it? It's not even that. It's, um, you know, when you think about, like, immortality or, like, if I tell you there's a thing that replicates itself perfectly, you think of, like, starfish and sea, sea slugs. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget if it's alligators or crocodiles, but one of them is functionally immortal. Oh, yeah, uh, alligators and uh, also sharks. Yeah, where it's just like... No, they don't. They don't die from. Um, they don't get old. They just get bigger. Mm -hmm. They keep getting bigger until they're they can't sustain themselves. They become too heavy to get food, because their cells just keep like you know they just keep growing. Yeah, that's why you could potentially have a giant giant megalodon shark, except it would be too slow to catch enough calories to keep itself moving yeah that's the issue speaking of like overpopulation mm -hmm. the whole fact that like the plot dealt with uh humans having to restrict breeding because there were too many humans it's like a very 70s problem it was something where people were looking at how populations were growing and they're like these are raising exponentially if it keeps up like this we're gonna have 50 billion humans on earth and there won't be room to stand and then 2020 happens is it not even 2020, it's I just know, like, as you get into the 80s and 90s, population growth dramatically slowed, it plateaued. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of going down in, in a lot of the industrialized areas. Japan. Japan, China's having that problem too. Yeah. For a while, you know, China for years had that famous like one, one baby, yeah. one baby policy because they're like, we have too many people. And now they have the opposite. Now they're begging people to have more kids. And so it's one of those things, it, it's always kind of funny to me where like you see... You see the first half of a graph, essentially, and you assume it's going to continue that way forever. Yeah. People are doing the same thing these days. I forget if I talked to you about this. A lot of people talking about whether or not Earth is a simulation. Oh, God. That that dumb theory. or It's not, it's not entirely dumb, but people are like, look at how fast computer technology has exploded from the 70s to the 90s. If it keeps going in that rate, we'll have computers that are like 800 times smarter than humans. Or it could taper off at some point because we can only make microchips so small and so fast. And also, like, the idea of dive technology and virtual reality in the regards that people think that it will be is fundamentally insanely difficult. It's, diff it's a difficult, it could be possible. It's just this assumption that, like, basically how society is now will continue on in the exact same straight line. When, like, you know, everything ebbs and flows. There are highs and lows. Mm -hmm. We're on the upswing of technology, but it's going to slow down at some point. We're going to reach a point where it's like, oh, we can't really can't really get any more megabits per second. It's just, we're done. Granted, at that point, we'll probably be able to do a lot of cool shit, but I don't think we'll be able to, to simulate, at like, thousands upon thousands of realities or whatever. Or if we could, why would we, we won't necessarily want to at that point? Because we could do a whole bunch of other stuff. I fear the day that TikTok goes the way of the beta max. <laughs> but yeah, it's that same idea that things will continue on that, that also has me questioning, at least for me, like, they still seem to have some kind of capitalism. They talk about, like, having to sell things and having jobs and using um, star chips or something. They have some sort of weird currency and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like... You know, I, I'm not going to say that, like, the future is going to be socialist or communist or whatever. But He, he does watch his political channel. <laughs> but it should have some other kind of system, right? Like, if people can live forever, and if space, like, we no longer have to find rooms to house humans. There's literally infinite space. We can go out anywhere. You could keep going out and find more planets to, to inhabit. So it's like, that's, that should have shifted up the paradigm somehow. Mm -hmm. they, they talk about Louis Wu wanting to make money and I'm like how does he make money he doesn't have a job he's 200 years old do you just work for all 200 years yeah is he retired I don't do you get like a stipend from the government they I, I have no idea mm. and the fact that there's a pan-galactic government too I guess they, they don't really go into that like at all 
but they mentioned that like yeah that all all of earth is pretty much under one earth government all of uh kazin is under a monarchy yeah which you know that i understand a monarchy in space you need to have strong central leadership if you want to have a galactic empire i'm honestly uncertain if democracy would be able to work in space just because of all the distances involved, how many different people would have completely different needs depending on what planet they're on and stuff. Ballot boxes really wouldn't work in zero G's. <laughs> zero G, just all sort like, I'd imagine there'd be like, you know, different, I mean, even Gundam did stuff like this where like the planetary colonies in Earth had completely different governments because they had completely different needs. Oh yeah, the, yeah, it's, and most, a lot of different sci-fi things have it so that yeah, there was at least a galactic imp- or a galactic government, and then somebody pissed off somebody, and <laughs> somebody, the South shall rise again, uh, but this time on Mars. Yeah, um, or I'm surprised that like they didn't do that thing where they're like, oh yeah, all our governance is handled by computers nowadays. We just have a computer that decides stuff. It knows it knows everything. Yeah, I think they actually said that it was an AI at one point, or I'm thinking of something else. I don't maybe. think they mentioned much of AI because you got to remember that like they computer did. was a pretty new term at this point. They did talk about AI, like I said, the actual like the translator was an AI. Yeah, they had a translator like device, but I don't think they talk. I don't think they use the word computer in this at all. Mm. I'm uncertain. It's really, that's one of those things that I was remarked on. Um, we almost read Isaac Asimov instead of this mm. foundation. I read iRobot a few years ago, and I was surprised by, like, he's describing, like, robots, and they need to make, like, changes to them, and, like, a mathematician gets out, like, a huge thing of paper and, like, a T-square and starts doing calculations by that, because for some reason, robots aren't computers. They can't process big numbers, and it's like, but that's, isn't that what robots are? They're, like, big number processors. (laughs) I'm confused as to how you have the technology to do this, but that's how they looked at it in the 70s. They thought computers would be big, dumb boxes that just could figure out languages but couldn't handle complex thought. Could we program him? We do not have the technology. (laughs) Uh, Can we program this VCR? We do not have the technology. (laughs) It is, it's, it's always weird when you look at that. There's it, uh, Star Trek kind of does the same thing where it looks at like logic mm. and it's like, oh, this machine is perfectly logical. Therefore, it can't handle humans being emotional or like it can't handle a logical paradox. And it's like now we have algorithms that are like, oh, hey, that's a logical paradox. I know the solution to that one or I'll just avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they, they could figure out to avoid these things if they were truly logical. Calculate the end of pi? Fuck no. Uh, like, oh, that'll be that'll result in a thing. I should just stop that. Which is dumb because if we were actually going to try and make an AI not kill us, that would be our best bail safe, really. <laughs> like, it's if you're going to make something that you're afraid of, which, like, a lot of people are, not, not give it the ability to act. It's fine. We've got John Carmack working on it. Oh, God, we're going to die. No, you don't understand. I- I'll have to show you afterwards. Oh, for, God. for any of you interested, go go on um go on YouTube, type in John Carmack CV11. This is going to be a, like, lemon uh, party. It's just going to be just it's a not. bunch of dudes jerking it's, each it's other It's just going to be a compilation of, guy, of, of a guy describing John Carmack, and then you'll understand why him working on AI... We're going to be fine. He'll stop the robots. Okay. Um, anyway. <laughs> I don't think we've, I think we've, we've gone far enough into outer space on this, uh, uh, podcast, this little podcast. Did you here. forget we were on a podcast? I don't know. I, we've be, we've been traveling on this ring world for so many years. I don't yeah, know anymore. We have managed to talk for quite a while. I mean, this is a pretty short bur- bu- bu- burger, <laughs> pretty short burger. I finished <laughs> it in about an hour. <laughs> Pretty short book. Fuck, why does it take you an hour to eat a fucking burger? It's a big burger. <laughs> it's just short. Anyway. Five minutes. It's yeah, we, we were worried a little bit before we wouldn't have enough content to talk about. But now, there, there, again, there's a lot of concepts, a lot of neat jumping off points, you could say, about a whole lot of different things. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's... it's The best part about this book is the uh, amount of shit they throw at you. And the worst part about this book is the, the amount, amount of, of shit, shit they, they throw like. at you. It's it's a really interesting read, but you got to be ready to be like, this makes no fucking sense. Yeah, I feel like we didn't quite do it as much justice. Maybe you should read it after all. Yeah. Sorry, I told you not to earlier. We didn't touch on like half as many. Th- Although, before we go, 
There are, there are two two little nitpicks I want to throw at the end here. Things about the ring world that I was like, you know, again, they, they take so much time to mention how big and cool and impressive it is. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, they built their cities and the cities are like buildings floating above other buildings. And then the power goes off and the buildings fell on top of the city. And it's like, why would you, why would you do that? That's the, without a fail safe? That seems like the most dangerous thing you would possibly do. Like there's you have you have so much room. Why would you build a floating city on top of a city? No guarantees that the fail safes didn't hold out for a long time. I suppose. I mean, there are a couple things that are still floating, mm-hmm. but it's just that idea of like you know you you don't have something that rely like I can't imagine living in a house underneath a flying skyscraper. <laughs> Just waking up every day and looking up and being like, I hope no one drops anything. I hope the power doesn't go out. I hope the fail safes don't go out. Uh, it's kind of like the same thing if somebody in uh, two thousand, uh, like 1901, you show them like, ah, you'll live in a building that's 70 stories tall. And they'll be like, the fuck I won't. That thing will blow over in the wind. <laughs> like it's It's basically like, you don't to know. be fair, a lot of people don't live in huge, massive skyscrapers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skyscrapers. But, but that's the that's the, the and point. they do occasionally collapse. Unfortunately, this happened in Florida not too long ago. But no, that's the point I was making. It's yeah. just like it, it. You wouldn't now, but the future people maybe. Who knows? Yeah, maybe it just seemed unnecessarily reckless, especially with how much room they had. But with the hubris of making a world of a billion worlds, is. <laughs> It kind of comes with the The world of a billion worlds that was destroyed by mold. Yeah. They they had they had almost faster than life travel. They had invincible materials. They could build a ring world, and then mold got into their energy conductors, and they couldn't uh, they couldn't repair them. Yeah, and also uh, we couldn't progress as a society because. Yeah. Well, that was actually kind of neat. The fact that like basically once their energy productors went down. Their ability to... They, they had devices that could make any atom out of any other atom. Mm-hmm. So they could take the hydrogen from space and turn it into gold or iron or steel. But then once the power went out, they didn't... They were like, fuck, we don't have the ability to do it. If everything reverted to the Stone Age. Except for you could never get to the Iron Age because they the ring world is constructed. There's just dirt. They didn't think to put, like, iron deposits in the ground because why the fuck would you do that? Mm-hmm. You're building a, a, a fake world. There's no reason to put, like, metal deposits in the ground. So they're like, yeah, they're just perpetually stuck with wooden and bone tools. They'll never smelt iron unless they find a way to get the old rusted corroded iron and make that good again. I do expect, I, I do picture, like, one one ring world engineer just being like, I saw this coming. And it's just like, he's been printing iron ingots for, like, 20 <laughs> years. Um, I have done nothing but print iron ingots for 10 days. <laughs> That is bad. <laughs> That's very... Yeah, I mean, to be honest, though, with how big the ring world, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, on the other half of the ring world, they just have power and everything's fine. They're like, what the hell's going on over there's, there? There's the ring world equivalent of the Swiss. They're like, what's going on? We've been baking chocolate. This is very <laughs> nice. You know, it also wouldn't surprise. They're like, yeah, we had faster than light travel, but we had no way to communicate with the other side of the ring world. <laughs> And that's, yeah, again, that's a great, uh, just of how fucking big this thing is. Yeah. It's just like, oh, it's, it's mind boggling. You could, they spend 90% of the second half of the book going from place to place. They never even reach the wall. Mm hmm. They start in like the center of it and they move directly towards the wall and move for like months and never reach the wall. <laughs> At like Mach 2. Oh, it's man. Like you could build a rocket and it, just imagine, like, you know, talking about, again, the entire thing is the orbital path of, like, Earth, essentially. So to, to go for, to fly a rocket from one end of Ring World to the other would be like going across the sun and going to the other side and landing on Earth. Like, we can't even get to, like, Mercury or Venus, much less three times that space. Seeker's dumbass is trying to find the top <laughs> of it. They find a Ring World guy with a sword who's, like... Who is John Carter, yeah. essentially? He's Conan like, the Barbarian. I he's... will I will find the base of the arch. I have continued to walk in one direction for 200 years. Someday I will find it. And Tila's like, 
I'm, I'm gonna bone that guy. I'm gonna bone that guy. He's hunky. Yeah, and everybody else is like, this dude's a dipshit. I don't know, yeah. Whatever, Tila, you can just stay here. We don't want to have to deal with your shit. Oh, but Tila Brown's gone? Okay, this podcast is over. Yep. But, but yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, that's, we're done. We're at the end. We've said enough. I've said enough. Have you said enough? I have many more things to say, but not about this. Oh, okay. Good. I hope you enjoyed this for this, this interesting podcast. It's nice to switch things up. Try some old sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Well, again, it wasn't exactly what I was expecting, but uh, I wasn't disappointed. I, I still got some cool stuff out of it. Yeah, it was fun. Next month, though, baby, we're back on track. Going with the Wheel of Time. We're going to be reading books 10 and 11. We've already read 10. I, just, to, just to let you know, we're ahead of you. you yeah. got a long way to go. Are, are we just destined to read things about circular things? <laughs> we're going from a ring to a wheel. The Wheel of Time. There are no beginnings in the Wheel of Time, but there are a beginnings. And there's that never didn't work a bottom with the to grammar rainbow. at all. Yeah, Not no. The slightest. It's, Th- it's thank okay. you guys for reading, and uh, just uh, good luck and keep reading. <laughs> Why do they need good luck? This isn't a competition. Also, you forgot to mention the Patreon. I kind of need to get paid so I can pay you. I do pay Brandon for being here, and I also have to edit this myself still. I don't make enough money on this to, to afford an editor. So if you enjoyed this show and you'd like to support it, Hard Leg Gaming Patreon down in the description. Mm-hmm. Just $1 gets you on the Discord. I have a uh, room on the Discord where we talk about the podcast, talk about upcoming books, occasionally have polls and stuff. I, I give people the ability to uh, submit questions. No one did this time. <laughs> I don't think anyone wanted to ring, read Ring World. I think it was just me. But, uh, you know, if you want to if you want to change what we read, if you want to suggest stuff, that's the place to do it. And again, mm-hmm. you get on there for just one dollar. Not only do you get that, but it helps out the channel as well. I'd appreciate it. Smile. Yeah. We'd love to have a bigger audience to talk about books about and uh, it'd be real nice. Yep. So, yeah, with that plugging out of the way now, I'm not going to say good luck because they're not Teal Brown. Yeah. Well, I kid that no one's Teal Brown. No one can be that lucky yep. um well thanks for coming don't know <laughs> furries just fucking keep reading and don't listen to that oh i'm gonna end with the furries part <laughs> i hate you so much